The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Morningstar IM, ABN 54071808501, AFSL 228986, and PIMCO Australia Proprietary Limited, ABN 54084280508, AFSL 24686 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. How are you now? And welcome to the Ensemble Investment Podcast. My name is James Whelan, VFS Group Investment Manager, and I'm here to represent you, the humble advisor, doing their best to walk the line between client interests and asset class selection. We're trying to find the things that are not only appropriate, but that are actually working to be in the right things at the right weight for the right clients. So get set, because myself and Morningstar are going to do our absolute best to answer some of the questions that have come up over the Ensemble platform. All the information contained is general in nature. So here we go. Morningstar Investment Management Australia is delighted to be sponsoring Ensemble's investment podcast series designed to equip advisors to have more meaningful conversations with clients. Morningstar Investment Management is a global leader in asset allocation, investment research and portfolio construction. Specialising in investing, behavioural coaching and practice optimization. Morningstar strives to give advisors the tools to confidently navigate their clients' complex needs. Morningstar, empowering investor success. This episode is brought to you by PIMCO, a global leader in active fixed income with deep expertise across public and private markets. PIMCO invests its clients' capital in income and credit opportunities that span the liquidity spectrum, leveraging decades of experience navigating complex debt markets. PIMCO's flexible capital base and deep relationships with issuers have helped it become one of the world's largest providers of traditional and alternative investment solutions and a valued financing partner. How are you now and welcome to the Ensemble Investment Podcast brought to you by Morningstar. My name is James Whelan, Managing Director of Barclay Pierce's Asset Management Division and I'm representing you. Now, the tumultuous 2022 is now a distant memory as yields spiked on global central banks' aggressive tightening regimes with the the efforts to dampen inflation almost seeming futile. We then saw the narrative switch to whether inflation was indeed as transitory as some said it was. And now we see disinflationary figures more and more in the headlines and the conversation is a battle between the next move is lower versus uh, the higher for longer crowd and the battle will continue through potentially into 2024, maybe. The recent Bank of America Fund Manager survey showed that institutional investors have made their biggest shift into bonds since the GFC. Now, so as you can tell, it's all about the bond market today. So let's dig into that and see why and where and how and see if we can figure something out for our clients. I am representing you, the advisor, today with questions that you have put into the Ensemble platform and we're going to get straight into them. Now, I couldn't ask for any two better names to get us there. Um, then I'm joined by Robert Mead, Head of Australia, Co-Head of APAC, Portfolio Management at Global Bond Manager, PIMCO. Robert, how are you now? Very good. It's great to be here. <laughs> and also joining us from Morningstar is James Foote, Head of Research for APAC. James, how are you now? Oh, well, James, great to be here. Good. Uh, fantastic. All right. Well, look, we're just going to stick with the stick with the cards. The questions that have come in from our advisor network have been phenomenal. Um, so I don't have much to do. I can just phone this one in and collect my check. First off, I'm going to start with you, Robert. Oh, mm-hmm. no, actually, we always do a mood setting question. Everyone gets the same sort of question. It's a really easy one. Um, so don't take any offense by it. Everyone gets the same thing. It just it, it, it helps set the scene for who you are and where you're from. What do you do and how do you make money? So I'm an active bond manager. Um, so looking at opportunity every day in terms of uh, markets, which are to the to, for all of our benefits have become much more volatile. So it's um, for a, for an active manager that means a lot more opportunity. Um, and so also thinking about things from all the way from sort of credit markets through to uh, to global government bond markets. Perfect, great intro. Now we're going to keep with this going. And the first question from one of our advisors, Robert, is the bond market reset over? Or is the choppy ride likely to continue? Good question. Well, I think, James, the, the, the good news is that central banks have done almost all the heavy lifting that they need to do. Now, as you mentioned at the start, there could be some more um, fine-tuning of policy. Like the, you can be in both camps in terms of higher for longer or maybe there's some some cuts coming eventually. But the, as I said, the good news is that we're basically in that in the in the right zip code 
um, where central banks will now fine-tune policy. So maybe you get another hike here or there, maybe you start to get cuts in 2024. Um, but we do think that all that heavy lifting's done. It means that all of the, uh, the underperformance from the bond market's largely behind us. And now we're all benefiting from much higher yields, um, to be able to invest in an asset class that for many, many years was, was relatively unattractive. And now the bond market with high yields is, is doing its job and will sort of keep every other asset class honest. No, it's not bad. Well, um, James Foot Morningstar, we're going to, same question for you. Is the reset over or is it still some more chop? Yeah, look, I think, you know, we, we have to acknowledge we've seen this major uptick in, in bond volatility. Absolutely. Um, especially in long-term bonds. I think there's potential for that to continue, at least while there's, there's questions around the inflation growth picture. We know that monetary policy works with a lag. Um, it remains to be seen. Um, I think if whether or not central banks will be able to thread the needle and effectively engineer this lower inflation situation without causing a serious downturn in the economy. We have a situation right now where markets are reacting strongly um, to the slightest hint that inflation might be rising or falling faster or slower than expected. And that's being reflected in asset prices, whether it be equities or bonds. But I think at the same time, um, with all this volatility comes opportunity. Um, the reality was that yields were too low in 2020 um, and in 2021. And in more recent times, that momentum has been in the opposite direction. You know, it never ceases to amaze me how singly focused um, the market can be at times. You know, when there's a dominant narrative, a dominant story, that story can swing from one side of the other to the other end. And it can often overreact along the way. Yeah. Is buying, so speaking of overreacting, is buying the dip as applicable to bonds as to equities, James? Look, I think weakness is often an opportunity um, to buy assets at lower prices, whether it be equities, whether it be bonds. The key, though, to me is valuation. So just because an asset falls doesn't mean it's cheap. Just because an asset's cheap doesn't mean it won't fall further. So having a sense for where fair value sits ensures you're more likely to be compensated for the risk um, that comes with the asset class. But again, volatility can be used as an opportunity to buy and sell around fair value. Valuation risk is often, it's, it's often ignored, but it really, really matters. Um, it never features on a laundry list of what can go wrong, um, but everything has a price. The question is, at all times, what's priced into the asset? What does that mean for the long-term performance profile of the asset. Now, nominal bonds are a relatively simple instrument. You know, the starting yield's known. It's known in nominal terms. What's not known is what that yield looks like after inflation. So, inflation matters. It matters a lot to nominal bond investors. And unexpected inflation is the enemy. But on the other hand, nominal bonds perform really well in scenarios where there's unexpected economic weakness and lower than expected inflation. Okay, that's... We'll, we'll we'll try and circle back around to that if we want. Rob, if you want to try and talk to that, then you can. Or if you want to talk about buying the dip uh, in bonds is, uh, is relevant, then go for it. Yeah, uh, I'd, it I'd, I'd say a couple of things um, in terms of responding to James. Is First thing is that buying a dip, buying the dip in the bond market is even more compelling than almost any other market because you're earning high yield. Yeah. So you're protected. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing to sort of bear in mind is, on, on James's comments, is – the valuation is has to be done holistically, not in isolation of any one asset class. And when you think about a bond market reset, almost by definition, the bond market is the first place where rates move. And then it's almost like in a technical term, it's the first derivative. Every other asset class needs to work out what high yields means for them and adjust accordingly. And when we look at today's environment – Many other asset classes haven't moved they ha or they haven't moved enough. So when you start to think about the relativities across different asset classes, bonds actually jump out as being incredibly um, good value um, and especially for investors that have run underweights, um, whether that's a structural target or just a sort of adjusting based on, uh, as James mentioned, when yields are very low, the allocations to bonds was very low, which was the right thing to do. Um, but, but acknowledging that, adjusting um, the portfolio allocations um, and taking a much bigger position in bonds. And I'll talk a little bit later about how compelling that valuation argument really is. 
Okay. Well, yeah, cheers for that. So, okay, next question. We're just going to keep, keep on tearing through these. After what happened in 2022, which I mentioned at the top of the show, how do I give my clients confidence to re-enter the bond market? Well, that should be pretty straightforward. Robert, we'll start with you. Yeah, I think it's um, it's uh, it's almost the flip side of that. It's like it's if if 2022 didn't happen, then you probably shouldn't be buying, but it did. Yeah, and so all of that repricing um, took place very quickly. Um, we've had the the most rapid tightening cycle in terms of monetary policy in living memory. Um, and again, James mentioned that economies have proved resilient, um, and inflation's been a little sticky. But nonetheless, um, that move in, in rates has been profound. So 2022 was the sort of most concentrated version of, of a bond market underperformance with that big reset yeah, um, of just, underlying interest rates. So it all happened all at once, didn't it? It happened very, very quickly. <laughs> and um, as I mentioned, the, most of that heavy lifting is now done. So it's in the price. Um, so, yeah, looking forward, um, 2023 and beyond – um, that that tailwind of higher yield um, means that the the bond asset class is not only um, protected, but it's also generating some very attractive income under almost all all scenarios when we look forward. James Foot, morning, sir. Yeah, man. bonds have had a ter- terrible few years. <laughs> it's, a pretty, it's a pretty simple question. This one isn't it? So how do you? Guess? But but some of the worst investment environments come off the back of periods where there's no perceived risk. But the opposite applies too. You know, there's a lot of noise around bonds at the moment. The reality is in investing, uncertainty is always present. Um, Important to lean into that noise, stand back, put the environment into longer term context. So, try and reframe the risk as an opportunity. And and I'll say it again, I think valuation is an underrated tool to do that, you know, to shift the risk reward back in your favor. As Rob said, we have high yields, we have cheaper prices right now for bonds that definitely creates buying opportunities they represent great value at the present time yeah yeah well I, okay now we're going to talk about that valuation because the next question is sort of on a difference in asset class sort of sub areas that are there why should we'll go with rob on this one so why should they i'm assuming that means clients why should they re-enter when they can get five percent on a term deposit yeah, it's a, it's a great question and it's mm. probably the question that comes up most in all honesty. Um, but there are there are um, multiple reasons why um, term deposits should play some role in a portfolio. It's, uh, it's one of those asset classes that has reset and it, and you should own some. But that's, if, if you're thinking about a reallocation um, of assets out of risky assets to more defensive assets, taking advantage of – high yields and also acknowledging that the economic outlook is uncertain. Um, all three of us have mentioned the word volatility many times and that applies to economies, markets um, and the outlook. And so, so term deposits do a, a number of things in a portfolio but they don't do a bunch of things that bonds do. So first thing is that term deposits are actually very illiquid. So if you, if you lock, it in, lock in your money for a year to get your money back – uh, earlier, you need to pay penalties. Yeah. So you don't have that degree of freedom to redeploy into other assets for that 12 month period or potentially even longer. Um, if we do end up in a much more distressed environment, and if central banks have, as we mentioned, have done a lot of heavy lifting, economies will feel pressure. There's been some lags, but pressure's coming. Then if, if things start to deteriorate in one year's time, you'll, and you, when you go to reinvest, you'll find that rates are much lower. So you may get a one-off opportunity um, to take advantage of some higher term deposit yields and then that's it. Yep. The opportunity has gone. Yep. And the final thing is that if you're looking for real defense in a portfolio, something that's going to, to outperform or be negatively correlated with your risky assets, then the, the price of term deposits doesn't change. But yep. if, if we do get a rally in yields, then bond prices will go up. So there's sort of at least three things where TDs do – the, the, something that people should be adding, no question, but it's not – you haven't completed that that asset allocation shift if you move out of risky assets and stop at cash. Yeah. You need to keep moving. Yeah, need to keep – James, what do you think? Hi, Rob, Rob put it really well. Yeah. Um, I'd maybe just add that an investment strategy is not just about selecting great individual investments. It's about combining them in a way that ensures that risk and return objectives are met 
at a holistic level. And, and as Rob said, TDs are providing great returns at the moment. They bring that reinvestment risk. So if rates happen to fall over the next few years, then investors will have less when they go to reinvest those proceeds. So that means bonds, again, play a serious role in portfolios. That role is diversification. That role is income. Bonds give that resilience. Um, During a recession, they can offset losses from growth holdings. Um, They're more liquid. They're more flexible than TDs. That flexibility, that liquidity allows for the asset allocation to move towards and away from assets as they move through the cycle. So it allows that active asset allocation um, to work through um, where you've got a liquid asset, you don't have that with a TD. With a TD, you're much more stuck. Yeah, it, it, it is obviously, I think that liquidity is the first and foremost answer to that question that's, uh, that, that comes into it. And yeah, I do agree, it does form part of a healthy balanced diet. The Now actually, James, sort of while we're sticking with you on that one, so this next question is probably more about what you've been talking about with valuations. Have the traditional rules of thumb for using defensive assets in portfolios now changed? You know, I think they have. Um, How so? Change for the better. Okay. I hope so. Um, you know, the scene's, <laughs> the scene's now set for bonds to play that traditional role once again uh, in portfolios, that role being income, diversification. Bonds are an excellent asset to offset uh, equity risk during periods where economic growth disappoints. But to act as that offset, uh, as Rob mentioned before, there needs to be scope for the yield to fall. And, and that's the case once more with bonds. So defensive assets have become markedly more attractive. You know, we like bonds more than we have for a decade. Um, we're prepared for surprises. Different duration profiles still factor into portfolio construction. But even still, bonds are much more attractive. The other thing I'd say is that um, some funds follow or some investors are invested in life cycle funds, those that follow a life cycle approach, uh, where you have equity allocations gliding down as one ages. But in a no-rate environment, like we saw through the pandemic, this placed a lot of pressure on the fixed income exposure. So the older cohorts with more bonds going forward, you know, these pressures have eased considerably. So bonds are genuinely back. And I think it's really exciting for all investors. That's, well, there you go. So uh, Rob, same question. Traditional rules of thumb for using defensive assets. Have, they, have, the, have the rules now changed? Yeah, I'd say uh, I agree with everything that James said, that the um – when when bond yields were sort of artificially kept low by central banks, but not only keeping um, cash rates low, but also buying bonds in the market, it's, um, it was hard for it was hard for bonds to sort of play that role that they they need to play. But sort of taking James's comments to it, the next step, like if you if you think about a and again, just to just to put some metrics around it, if you think about a traditional sixty forty portfolio, yeah, my favorite. So. So most people don't have them, but it's a good way of sort of providing some sort of uh, some sort of metric around or, or calibrating just how cheap or how expensive assets yeah. are. Yeah. So it's a line. It's a yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a line a, in the it's, sand. It's, it's a, of, yeah, exactly a right. Yeah, I get you. I get you. I get you. Yeah. So if you think about if if you were to look at sort of efficient frontiers and like stuff we learned in the textbooks, yeah. and said at December two thousand and twenty one. The sixty forty portfolio. What what? Where should you have been invested? And deck twenty one. Instead of having forty percent in bonds, you should have had fourteen. Right. So a massive underweight. Based on the based on the the, the Just, metrics. The, exactly. The, the, the maths and the and, and based on expected yeah. returns from the different asset classes, the expected return from bonds was low. Yeah. So fourteen percent. Yeah. A very small position. Yeah. yeah. If you rerun the numbers today, instead of being forty percent bonds, you'd be seventy. So 30% overweight. Now, the last thing I'm suggesting to anyone listening is to be 30% overweight bonds. I'm yes, not this, suggesting this doesn't that. constitute advice, everyone. Sorry, I should have put uh, that at the top of the Yeah, show. I'm it's not good. suggesting that. But if you've got zero or if you've got 10 yeah. or if you've got 20, you need to buy more because yeah. at least get back to neutral, whatever your neutral is. It's time to be at neutral. It's not time to have a massive underweight like you should have in uh, at sort of 18 months to two years ago. Yeah. I, I do remember sort of for a fair chunk of last or 2022 or so talking that this is the it's going to see the return of the of the 60 40 portfolio that that that, yeah. that 40 is actually going to mean something and and it will be and I'm, I'm going to go a little bit off piece because it's going to sort of go into the next question on this one so whoever wants this one wants this one but if if I'd said with the amount of inflows that there have been into bonds so so Insto is now the the biggest bond holders 
in since the GFC. We've seen, I had some numbers here on corporate. Corporate bond flow has been, so November corporate bond flow has been the biggest since, I'm trying to figure out since when. I'm, I'm looking at this chart, it goes back all the way to, to July 2020. The corporate inflows have been such so huge. If if we'd said, and James, you could probably want to take this one because it's more about portfolio allocation and things like that. But and if we'd said that 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 was going to happen, do you think that the the equities market would have been as strong as as we currently see it being? Look, I think it, it's a good question, but I, I'll go back to the end of December twenty twenty one. Yeah. So leading into twenty two, the period Rob mentioned. Yeah. And the optimized allocation um, bonds were unattractive, but the reality was equities were also overvalued and unattractive at that point. Yep. And since then, we've seen nominal losses in bonds. We've seen nominal losses in equities. There was no safe harbor yeah, in was, nominal terms. I was in, there. In real, terms, <laughs> there was no, in real terms, there was no safe harbor. Yeah. So, we've had valuations moving around for equities. We've had valuations moving around for bonds. We've had yields increase, you know, materially. And, and, and you know, it's good to see money flowing towards that. When it comes to credit, though- Rob will have strong views on this, but there's two parts to it. You know, the spread as well as the base. The base rates increase. The spread, well, the spread's a different question, and and maybe that's that's something we could ask Rob about. Yeah, I think there's um there's a, there's a lot of uh, layers to those questions. So um, <laughs> it's all right, we can. So so it's uh like very high quality borrowers now offering yields of six or seven percent. Yeah. Um. Again, these are single A type borrowers. With uh, sort of five year ish bonds, like there's the yields are now compelling. Um, if you go further down the credit curve, there's there's um, obviously more risks associated with uh, with economies that may or may not slow down a lot. Um, so we're a little cautious further way down the, the credit structure. But the high quality parts of the credit market, it's it's not surprising that the flows you're talking about are materialising because the yields on offer are often well in excess of dividend yield. Um, and then also, as you, as you mentioned, with the with the equity market, so far we're in the we're in somewhat of a Goldilocks where, with the, while while there's a belief that rates will stay a little higher, and again I've sort of, I've, I've stopped talking about higher for longer. It's more about high for longer because they've already moved higher. They don't yeah. need to go that much higher. They're just going to stay high. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that just means that earnings eventually will start to come under pressure. Um, highly levered corporations or highly levered households are becoming more vulnerable. Um, as James mentioned, some of the policy lags are still taking time to flow through. Um, but eventually we're going to get some economic stress in order to get inflation back down to target. And so, so while we're on that pathway, sort of looking at the, the, some of the high yielding, higher quality parts of the corporate bond market, again, look very attractive. Yeah, well, I, I suppose that, okay, well, this leads into another one of these questions here. And I think that, that this next question might just be for James that's on here. So, I mean, if you wanted to say that that maybe the core and satellite portfolio structure is, is one that a lot of people talk about and one that people have, where you have your core structure and then you have a few things that are sort of on the outside. Potentially corporate corporate debt might be one of those satellite things that you have at the moment that, that, that looks okay and, and seems all right, especially if you think that maybe there's going to be a few cuts coming in at the, at the top end of 2024. Does the core and satellite need to be done differently now? And I'll let you just have at this one. Yeah, I think, look, to me, the main thing is to have transparency around the look-through portfolio positioning. So, knowing exactly where or how much credit duration inflation protection is in the portfolio, where that's invested on, on a regional basis matters too. And I think using a specialist credit or duration satellite is valid. But the most important thing by far is understanding the positioning so that you can construct the rest of the portfolio in a way that doesn't expose or doesn't overexpose the portfolio to unacceptable risk. The same goes for any core too. Um, but back onto the, any potential satellite, I think high yields is an asset that is a good example. It can underperform during a recession. You, you just want to have a sense for how much effective beta sits in the portfolio within the fixed income component and the equity component, obviously. Did you want to, did you want to go into that a little bit? Yeah, so the sensitivity to equity uh, performance is, is the beta and, and you can have that within, within bonds. You have that within credit and yeah. you have different levels of beta within credit depending on where it sits in the credit spectrum. So high yields that the most high beta asset and you just want to know how much you've got so you can manage the whole, whole of the portfolio appropriately. Um, and more importantly, you want to make sure you're getting paid for that beta or that risk Keep coming back to the total portfolio implications. Have you got assets to provide resilience under a range of scenarios? Um, are you building that resilience without 
overpaying. You know, one of the terms I really like is valuation-driven diversification. So, are you leading towards assets or are you leaning towards the cheapest assets to then perform under a range of scenarios? Okay. And uh, and then there's a way of testing. Uh, You know, we'll go into that in a bit. Okay. If I'm going to keep on going with the questions, otherwise we're going to run out of time. Uh, Here's an underarm question for you, Rob. Can bonds benefit from an active approach? Yeah, that is a that is a good one for me. That's, um, <laughs> That's what I'm going with first. <laughs> so y- yes, like um, the, the 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 great thing about um, active management, no matter which asset class you're managing, is the more volatility in the underlying asset class that you're responsible for, the the more active management works, the more alpha can be generated. So. For long periods of low vol, um, it makes life difficult for an active manager. But when now we're back in a high vol period, it's 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 perfect timing. Mm-hmm. Um, and and James alluded to a, quite a few of the sort of areas that to, to think about in terms of how to be active, in terms of increasing or decreasing exposure to interest rate risk or duration. Thinking about where to where to invest on the credit spectrum from high quality right down to high yield or bank loans or even private credit, um, they're all active decisions. Um, thinking about how curves move around, so whether it's central banks are doing something or whether the back end of yield curves are, are respond are responding to uh, different economic signals, all these things are, are alpha generative. Um, and having a having a proprietary view, trying to think ahead of the market in terms of what's happening in economies, what's happening um, in terms of relativities across economies around the world, all these things are, are decisions that we make every single day, um, and try to preempt what's what's next. And so, yeah, I, I, I sort of a pound the table, yes, <laughs> um, and they're a very very firm believer in just in what's available in terms of the in terms of the active universe. Well, we'll see the APAC head of research uh, from Morningstar, James. Do, do, do uh, can bonds benefit from an active approach? So, in this area, our research shows that you need to be very good to add value in fixed income. So, yeah, yes, it's possible, but average is not good enough. But to be honest, that applies to equities as well. Yeah, it's no different. As Rob said, I think you've had this situation where distortions um, to equity and fixed income markets occurred. Um, in recent years from QE and that meant that sort of fundamental analysis through that period when QE was in play was less important than overarching liquidity. Those distortions really impacted relative value of all assets. So, that's changed now. Um, It means that fundamentals matter more again and fundamentals matter everywhere Um, but they're particularly important when there's a credit angle. You know, in the current environment, Rob mentioned this before, before, there's a lot of divergence at the underlying credit, um, within underlying credits, um, you know, for prospects between sort of the, me- the, the least and most um, credit worthy borrowers. So, I think that's one, another place where active management can help. Okay. So, now we're going to get into the, into the fun stuff. So, as myself as being, as being someone who's on the front line talking to retail clients and allocating portfolios based on risk profiles and everything that goes on in that, traditionally... What you have is that if someone comes through as a as a higher risk investor, um, or that they're more happy to see potential um, uh, uh, declines in their portfolio over a long term growth, then that you'd allocate them as a more as a high risk and a high high growth portfolio, which traditionally would not have many bonds in it. And now we're looking at a, at, at at the perspective where if there are cuts over in the in the in twenty twenty four, then we're going to see that the bond market is going to rally further. So what the, here's the question: What role do bonds have in growth portfolios now? It's I think that potentially has changed. Robert, we'll, we'll, we'll kick off with you. Yeah. So so if, when you think about um, efficient portfolio construction, and you think about um, sort of how to um, allocate between sort of risky versus defensive assets, there's there's always a role, no matter how how long your investment horizon is. There's always a role for having diversification. There's always a role for having assets in the portfolio that are not perfectly correlated. You, you want to have some things that are either lowly correlated or, or at best negatively correlated mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. your efficient, um, your efficiency of the portfolio in risk adjusted return terms, then, um, you always have to have to have a mix of assets. Then it's just a matter of how much you need, um, depending on your, time horizon um, in terms of wanting to 
ride out periods of volatility. So when yields are very low, while there still should have been some bonds in a portfolio, it would have been a very small fraction of an overall portfolio. Now when we have expected returns from the bond asset class not dissimilar than expected returns from other asset classes, that mix, and we talked about the 60-40, and if you had a, if you were an 80-20 because you were, had a very long investment horizon, even versus the 20, you should at least be at, at sort of market weight, if not slightly overweight. So yes, the, the bonds will continue to play a very important role uh, in every portfolio, in, including a growth portfolio. James, similar sort of thing. Bonds, bonds in growth portfolios, not traditionally seen front row center, but where do, where do they play a part now? Yeah, I couldn't agree more with what Rob said. I think um, it depends how we define growth. You know, we can define it many ways. But just going back to our comments earlier, a couple of years ago, there were genuine questions being asked about the, the viability of the traditional 60-40 portfolio. I guess here in Australia, we... Our traditional 60-40 is really the 70-30. That's, that's, gen- that's typically our default. Um, it's the same question. You know, and during the pandemic, that was the right question. How viable was 60-40? Um, was it dead? That was the question being asked. Um, you had paper-thin yields. Bonds had lost their capacity to work as a portfolio ballast. So investing really through that environment um, meant directing exposure back towards the most attractive areas. That included in e- equities, you know, even broad beta within equities held in a set and forget fashion at times has been painful. But again, the environment today is completely different. You know, bonds are truly back as that viable diversifier and that's so important um, for the rest of the portfolio. So having an asset like bonds that has the scope to do well in recession, it actually means that exposure to equities can be higher than it otherwise would have been simply because of the diversification benefits that bronze, bonds bring back into that portfolio Okay, that, that does that does make a lot of sense. We're going to keep on going into this one here. So we've got a question here, and then it all, it's almost almost time to wrap it up with some final bids. But we'll see how we go. So bonds in an aggressive portfolio, would you put them in? That I think that I'm sort of just trying to decipher this question because it's more of a statement than a question. So my job is to turn it into a question. So excuse me for this one. It says bonds bonds have a place in an aggressive portfolio now, as they are able to offer six to eight percent returns depending on the vehicles used. Now that's not actually a question, but. <laughs> Rob, would you like to, to to start with that one? So bonds in, a, in going even further, an aggressive portfolio, just because of the yields. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, the another another yes from me. So it's 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 great actually to be sitting here as a bond manager and being able to talk so positively about my asset class. It hasn't, <laughs> it hasn't happened for a, quite a few years, but um, finally we're there. So so my answer to that is there's there's in the bond market there's something for everyone today. It's not like tomorrow or let's wait and do something in the future. There's something for everyone today. And if you're, if you're looking for sort of higher returns, there's all sorts of great opportunities in, in private credit markets, especially those ones that have actually been marked to market. There's a few examples out there that are still taking a very long time to, to reprice. But uh, newly deployed capital, you're now talking mid-teens. For very high quality, and as you mentioned, you're still talking 6 to 8%. Um, so there's something for everybody, um, especially in that scenario where economies do start to slow down. And so there's, we haven't really talked about that much today, but there's a, there's genuine, um, risks out there with this very, very aggressive, um, rate hike cycle and the determination of central banks to get inflation back down to target means they need to inflict pain on some parts of the, of the global economy. So, Again, when you start to think about asset classes on a relative basis, um, even if you're sort of chasing much higher returns, um, there's something to do in the bond market today, not uh, not waiting till tomorrow. Absolutely. Well, I mean, you mentioned that we haven't mentioned much about the economic outlook. Would you, did, did you want to go into that a little bit? I mean, it, it, it's it's not necessary, but it's, yeah, it's so, right in your wheelhouse. <laughs> so, yeah, no. So, we, we are in the camp that um, there's no Goldilocks outcome where – Economies keep growing, inflation miraculously comes down, and interest rates go back down. Hmm. So that that Goldilocks won't happen. Like we may get lower interest rates if we have a recession, we will, but that needs to. We need to move on that pathway to recession and understand what that means for every every asset class. So if we do end up in recession, then earnings will be under tremendous pressure. The unemployment rates will be going up. And sort of the ability for 
the household to consume will be further curtailed. So all of those things mean the equity market will will start to start to crack um, under that scenario. Now that may or may not happen, but we're not going to end up with both lower rates and 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 an economy that continues to grow. Yeah. So as long as you're factoring those scenarios into your um, asset allocation decisions, then that's fine. But you need to factor that in because that that Goldilocks won't be happening. So when we look at all all of our models and you look at history, any starting point that has, and like when you look at all of the sort of global economic cycles, any starting point that has um, unemployment at this level, at this low, accompanied by with inflation at these high levels, there's never been a soft landing. There's always been a hard landing. So we have to sort of justify why this time could be different to not avoid some sort of recession or recession-like economic outcome. So what is, what's the most likely scenario then in, without so, being any too specific? Yeah, so we, we think just unemployment needs to go up by a couple of percentage points in almost every developed economy. Um, most of the inflationary pressures are coming from the service sector now. The, the good sectors have started to slow a bit yep. um, in terms of those inflationary pressures. The easiest way to get good uh, service inflation down is to have higher unemployment. Um, so all of those things suggest that we do end up in a in a slightly weaker economic scenario. We're not calling for a deep recession, but we are thinking that economies and certain sectors of economies, especially the very highly levered sectors, they probably already feel like they're in recession. Um, if you're a highly levered household with uh, interest rates continuing to go up, you're, you're already feeling the pinch. You can see it in the consumer numbers. You can see it in consumer spending and consumer sentiment. Um, and all these things are intentional to try to get inflation back to target. Yeah, yeah. And, and we are seeing and the amount of – I've spent a lot of time in the last couple of weeks sort of focusing on the US consumer as being the one of the biggest drivers of everything that happens on the planet, that it seems like more and more all of the research that's coming out of the big houses is saying that good spending is going to continue to be – the big box stuff is going to decline. Small stuff might stay maintained, but everyone is going to be looking at more services and experiences as going through. So it's interesting what you said there. Yeah, and then you think about the the U.S. consumer versus the Australian, and um, the U.S. household's been incredibly well protected because they they borrow they borrowed for thirty years at two percent on the houses. They've got about half as much leverage as the Australian household. Um, so the U.S. household is is very resilient compared to Australia. Mm. The Australian household is way more vulnerable. Tell me about it. Um, so if with with even though the RBAs sort of cash rate is about a percentage point below the US, um, we think that pain is going to start to be felt uh, very quickly over the next um, over the next few quarters as all of those lags and the excess savings that households had, some of the fixed rate mortgages that were available that are all rolling off, um, these things will start to bite very early in uh, 24. Yeah. Well, James, while we're on the subject of economic, economics and economy sort of general, usually I start the podcast that way, but we went into the questions and now we've got some time at the back end to talk about economic outlook. Is there anything in your in your brain that's sort of ticking along with where you see things going on at the moment? Look, yes. I think for us it's about protecting the portfolio under a range of scenarios uh, should they eventuate, whether it be hard landing, soft landing, inflation drifting back down into our target without there being any adverse consequences or if there are adverse consequences, ensuring that portfolios are positioned for all of those scenarios um, appropriately. And again, it comes back to what's priced into the asset. And so within the, equ- I know this is a bond podcast, but within the equity market, it's fine. So, so it's all connected. It's all right. Rob alluded to this earlier. You've got um, parts of the equity market, frankly, have not repriced for where bond yields are today. Mm. And so that's something to watch. You've got other parts of the equity market that are being priced for a downturn. And so there's, there's, there's parts of the market that are priced for certain things that are parts of the market that are not. I just think it's important to be selective, important to be valuation aware, and important to cover off against a range of scenarios. Well, I think that I might be okay to close it up there unless anyone wants to have anything last uh, that, that they put in here. But I, do, I do have a tradition of just saying last bids and seeing if anyone wants to put, put something in. So, look, with an all silent on that one, I'm going to wrap it up here. Thank you, everyone, for the questions that were put forward into the Ensemble platform. Please continue to put more of those questions in and I will continue to do my absolute best to ask them here. Thank you so much, Robert Mead, 
head of uh, head of Australia. I've got head of Australia and co-head, but I know you're co-head of APAC Portfolio Management at uh, PIMCO. Thank you very much for that, Rob. My pleasure. Thank you. And James Foote, head of research for APAC at Morningstar. Thanks, mate. Thanks very much. All right. Thanks very much, everyone, and have yourself a good time and stay safe.